Hello everyone, it's Zainab. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for today's workshop uh, as an introduction to deep learning with Dr. Haider al Mohri. Um, Dr. Haider is a data scientist. He's also an uh, innovation and digital business manager at Siemens here in Kuwait. Uh, with a PhD from Wayne State University. His interests include statistical machine learning and data analysis. So we're very excited to hear a bit more about how to do this and he was very, very generous to help us today by offering a hands-on workshop uh, to help the community understand deep learning a little bit more. So without further ado, Dr. Heather, uh, please <coughs> proceed. Uh, any questions and answers will be left till the end um, as per Dr. Hedda's request. So uh, kindly write them in the chat or any difficulties you have, and then we will address them when we're finished with the talk. Go ahead, Doctor. Thank, thank you so much. Salam alaikum, everyone. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Zainab, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I think Dr. Zainab uh, uh, did do the job for the, for the introduction and uh, I will not uh, go through um, introduction anymore. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, if you check the chat section, uh, I, uh, I've posted um, a couple of links. These are the links. The first one uh, you can um, get the code that we'll be using. We'll be using Google Collab. I will talk about it a little bit more once we get to that um, uh, section. And uh, the second one is a folder in Google Drive where you can find all the data sets that we'll be using today. And I also shared a third link. It's a YouTube video. If you get a chance um, to watch this, it will just uh, tell you the, how to get started with Google Collab. Uh, it's very easy, so there is nothing complicated. It, you, sh you shouldn't have a problem, So, but it's, if you got a chance, and just go ahead and take a look at this video. Other than that, um, let's get started with the, um, with the uh, let's call it mini workshop. Uh, the topic will be introduction to deep learning, and uh, this is the agenda for tonight. Um, so I will start with just some high level definition of what is machine learning and what uh, are the you know types of machine learning and then we jump into uh, one branch of neuro uh, of machine learning which uh, or one of the tools in machine learning which which are the neural networks we'll define it we'll see the architecture of the neural network we we'll touch upon some applications and then we slowly move into the uh, re, uh, the, the core topic of tonight's uh, session, which is deep learning. Uh, other than that, and then we'll start some theory. Maybe you get uh, bored here, uh, but please bear with me. We'll have some fun at the end. Uh, we'll, because I, I, my goal here tonight is just have everyone to have a solid understanding of what's going on beyond, beyond the codes that we write, for example, in Python or R or any other. Um, programming language. I will not go into deep theory, uh, just some high level um, uh, uh, intuition or introduction to the math and the modeling and the uh, what's going on beyond uh, the, these um, models. And then we go, uh, we finish with the, you know, after, so right from here is all theory. Uh, and then at the end, we will have our hands-on practice, uh, which uh, is basically the, the, the uh, link that I shared with you on, the, on Google Collab. So let's start with uh, machine learning. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is a very broad topic and very broad field. Basically, uh, what machine learning is all about is uh, that human, define inputs and the structure and the output and then we expect the computer to learn the parameters uh, we'll see what those parameters what the parameters mean maybe some of you um, because i don't know the um, i assume that we have 
uh, a diverse uh, audience. So um, some of you might be even familiar with these uh, terminologies. So basically we want the, the computer to do some smart uh, thing, some, some smart task for, for us. Uh, we, we let the machine learn some specific task. Okay, so that's about machine learning. Uh, as I said, it's a very broad topic. It's a very broad field uh, and uh, it's even picking up um, in a very past pace uh, these years in the, I, I would say in the past 10 or 15 years. And um, uh, so we can categorize machine learning into three broad categories. Um, one is supervised learning. Uh, second is unsupervised learning, and third is reinforcement learning. Again, these are very broad categories, um, and you, somewhere else you might see different um, categorization of um, the, the the machine learning types. Let's if um, let's say um, there is no right or wrong answer to this, but uh, a lot of people just stick with these three categories. So what is uh, supervised learning? Uh, in supervised learning, we actually have some labeled examples, some labeled data. By labeled, we, we mean the answer or the, uh, the variable of interest is known. So for, for instance, we have, uh, we have a data of pictures of cats and dogs, for instance. So we already have this data these pictures and we know that this picture belongs to a to a cat this pic picture belongs to a cat this picture belongs to a dog and this picture belongs to a cat so we this is the known part or they call it the label data because this so this is a data and this is a label the label here in this example is cat the second one is cat dog and cat these are the labels so they call it the training data because we want to use this data in order to train a model or to train, a, well, let's say just speaking very general, to train the machine, the computer, to do something for us. In this case, we want to predict. So we want the, the machine to learn whenever the, the machine sees a picture of a cat, we want the machine to give us uh, the, the answer and say, okay, this picture is a cat. So what happens, we use this training data, we train the machine, and later on we use that model, we use that um, intelligence that we created in order to uh, predict the future. So we, we use this data to train, and then later on we test it on this train uh, of this test data. And in this, uh, in this example, for instance, um, the the real um, uh, the, the reality was for this picture was a dog and we predicted dog. The reality for this picture again was a dog and we predicted dog. And for this example, it was a cat and we predicted a cat. And of course, it's not as intelligent as a human, so we always commit error. In this case, and in this example, which is pretty much very hard, even for me, as if I look at this picture, it's very, very hard to, to me to say uh, whether, I mean, it looks like a dog, but the computer is not, um, it's just the, the, the algorithm uh, has predicted that this is a dog, but it, this is a cat, but in reality, it's a dog. So this is um, supervised learning, which means we, we have the supervision, we, the, we have access to labeled data. We use that um, labeled data and in order to create a model in order to teach the machine to predict the future. Okay. So, uh, so for example, uh, the picture, when we are talking about pictures, because we'll be doing some, some pictures later on in the course, uh, it's, uh, let's just talk about pictures, how the, they work. So a digital picture, uh, if it contains uh, colors, in fact, the way it is stored in a computer uh, is by a, uh, by by 
a match by three dimensional matrix. Okay, so because we have three channels, red, green, and blue, and each of these uh, matrices contain pixel values. So pixel values for the red channel, pixel values for the green channel, and picture pixel values for the blue channel. Any colored pic digital picture is stored like this. Of course, there are other ways, but mostly RGB uh, is used for storing the pictures. So, uh, so when we insert or we input this image into the computer, into the machine, into the uh, model that we want to train, um, of course, most of the time, um, there are ways to deal with it in this, uh, in this uh, form. But most of the time, we we're gonna flatten all these numbers, all these matrices into one long vector. Uh, we'll get into this later, but it's just for you to just have an understanding on how, how, how the digital picture usually and uh, often wor uh, works in, uh, in machine learning. So if we flatten all these uh, three matrices, we will have the 255, 231, and all the way to 202 um, uh, in, in one in the first part of the vector and then we start the second part which is the green channel and all the way to the blue channel and the last pixel so we will end up with a, a very long vector so for example if we had um, uh, let's see if we can use this so if we had like this is what one two three four five so this is five by four image we have one, two, three, four, five uh, rows and one, two, three, four, five, uh, one, two, three, four columns. So each of these matrices are five by four. So each of the matrices have 20 elements. And when we flatten it right here, we will have 20 times three. So we end up with a um, 60, with this vector will have a length of 60, okay? Uh, so that's the supervised learning. And unsupervised learning, in contrast, we don't have access to the data ahead of time. So our data, the, the, there does not exist, the, label do not, the, uh, the labels do not exist in the data. So we are dealing with unlabeled data. Example, clustering. In clustering, uh, and very simple, uh, or one of the most uh, popular uh, techniques in clustering is k-means. Uh, and it's basically, we are given a bunch of data right here, and we want to cluster these data, meaning we want to find similar data points and group them together. One way is just using k-means, as I said, so we find uh, basically the data that um, are close to each other and just assign them to this group and this group and this group. In this case, we are not dealing with, um, lab with labeled data, meaning we, are, we, we just have the input, we don't have an output. If we call this, the, the pictures input and uh, uh, the labels output in the supervised learning, we have access to uh, input, X and output Y. Whereas in this case, we only have X's, we only have data. And all we need to do is just group them together. Unsupervised learning clustering is one example in unsupervised learning. There are other examples, uh, but that's not the core what uh, we want to talk about in this um, workshop. And then we have uh, something more involved, which is called reinforcement learning. In fact, nowadays, it's a very, very hot topic uh, in the research community. And uh, you, you know, the supervised and unsupervised learning, they are kind of saturated. I, I mean, there are still a lot of uh, research, especially in the, in, the, in the application side, but they are very much um, saturated. I mean, it's been there for a very long time and people have done a lot of nice work. But right now and these days, this is a very hot topic, uh, reinforcement learning, 
basically the reinforcement learning is learning through repetition and experience. One example, and uh, if you have seen the, when the machine, the computer um, uh, plays like very sophisticated games, and uh, you see that after some time, the computer magically learns how to, this, to, how to play this uh, game uh, better, even, uh, even better than human. This is through uh, most of the time, or maybe all, all the time is through reinforcement learning. It means that you throw the uh, computer in the field, in this case, the Mario um, game, and then you, there are of course a lot of sophisticated and uh, uh, complicated mathematical calculations behind it. Uh, they usually use the reward, uh, uh, the reward and penalty uh, uh, method so that if the computer does a right, uh, takes a right decision, it will be given a reward. And when the computer commits a mistake, uh, there will be a penalty associated with it. Um, so I don't, I don't think we have time to go um, to watch these videos, but I will hopefully share these with you. You can watch them. They are I mean, amazing things have been happening in this field and it's a very, very uh, hot area of research nowadays. So with that being said, uh, <clears throat> neural networks, now we, talk, we want to uh, talk about neural networks. What are neural networks? And uh, so if we look at the, or search on the internet, Investopedia, Investopedia, they define neural network uh, as follows. They say a neural network is a series of algorithms that attempts to recognize underlying relation relationships in a data set through a process that mimics the way the human brain operates. And that's where the neural network uh, name is coming from because uh, they, uh, they, I mean, I don't know in, in reality and in practice how much relevant it is, but uh, the way it works uh, is similar to the way the neurons in the brain uh, work in a human body. Okay, so this is a very general uh, definition uh, of uh, neural network, but when we come to Wikipedia, you can, you can find some nicer uh, definition. It says interconnected, so what, are, what, what, is, what is a neural network? It is an in, interconnected group of natural or artificial neurons that uses a mathematical or computational model uh, I would uh, just stop here and uh, I want to say that, okay, everything beyond uh, what's happening is mathematics. Uh, of course, we have some computation, but the core uh, building block is uh, linear algebra, mathematics, and we will see later on how optimization works uh, in order to, um, to, to build a neural network. So it uses mathematical or computational model. I would... I would say or and and, I think it's better. Uh, for information processing based on a connectionistic approach. I, I don't know this uh, um, word, but what all it means is that they are interconnected. The neurons are connected to, to, to each other. And then they say neural networks are nonlinear statistical data model modeling or decision -making, making tools. So they are a way uh, that you can model nonlinear data, and then we also will see later on uh, why is that true. And uh, so it's we can with with this using this tool you can model data, or uh, it helps us to do decision making. They can be used to model complex relationships between inputs and outputs to find patterns in the data. Okay, so all that is all about a neural network. They are very powerful. And we'll see why in recent years uh, they have been um, uh, gaining popularity uh, uh, much more. So uh, we'll just start with a very simple example. Uh, 
maybe people in this field have already because that's, that's how usually people start uh, teaching machine any machine learning course they start with this housing price example so let's say that we have given the size of the house and we want to predict the price so we have a bunch of uh, houses we are giving the size of the house and we want to learn uh, to uh, to predict the price of that house let's assume that the, if we plot a scatter plot of the data uh, we see something like this so the x-axis is the size of the house in square feet and the y-axis is the price in u.s dollars um, i don't know if we can find a, a, a house with 500 but just let's assume that this is time i don't know uh, time 100 okay so uh, and it makes sense that the, the the larger the house is, the the higher the price would be. Of course, a lot of other factors uh, uh, would uh, uh, we should take into account. But let's for now just assume that this is true. Then this is the data that we have. Okay. So given that we have an input x, remember the input is a data is the information that we have about something that we want to predict in this case we have the information about the size of the house so that's our input x so we uh, feed the input x into something called neuron we will see what's going on and, and this is the brain of the neural network inside this circle so let's just for now just say we just say that we feed it into a neuron and we expect a magic happens inside this circle and it spits out the price y which we are interested in okay so this is a very simple um, um, uh, illustration of a neural network okay so this is, yeah, as I said, almost a simple neural network. In general, neural network is formed by taking many of the single neurons and stacking them together. So in this case, we just said we have one neuron, but in practice, we normally stack a lot of these neurons together and use them in order to produce the result, produce the uh the the output which is the price in this case okay so as i said so in this example we just had one input uh, and i did that just to make things simple and so, so that we can even uh, we can be able to um to plot it but in reality the size is not the only factor that uh, that determines the price of a house uh, there are a lot of different factors. We just mentioned a few of them for the sake of illustration. So we have the size, let's say now we have the information about the number of bedrooms and we have the postal code associated with the address of that house. And we have the wealth of that area, let's say, if we, just, if we can just quantify that value. And that also um, is a factor that determines the size. So for example, if we take the example here in Kuwait, uh, the houses in, uh, I don't know, Doha, are, are, the prices are different uh, when compared to the, uh, to the house prices in Abdullah Salam, for example. So these are the inputs. These are our Xs. Uh, let me just call it X1, X2, X3, and X4. So we, we um, feed these information into these neurons. In this case, we decided to have three neurons here. And then we have another, this is called output uh, layer, we'll see now. Uh, we, we, we take the output of these neurons. So here is the input, the raw input. We, imp we feed them into the neuron and the neuron and each neuron produces some output. Some output, we'll go through these later. And then uh, these outputs are again uh, fed to another neuron, which this neuron 
produces the, um, the prediction, let's say, which is the price of the house in this case. So, so now we need to provide the input, the training data, as I said, and output the target data. And the stuff in the middle here, I mean, the neurons uh, will be figured out by itself. Of course, it's, when we say figured out by itself, it doesn't mean that we um, do not uh, interact with it or we don't have control over it. But the beauty of neural network is that once you, once you um, build it and construct it correctly, you don't need to worry about what's happening inside, okay? So in uh, the neural network uh, um, community, they call the, in this, uh, the, the input data, they call it the input layer. The stuff in the, in the middle, they are called the hidden layer here. And this piece, the neuron that produces the output or the, um, the, the answer is called the output layer. Why they call it hidden layer is because, okay, so input layer is uh, clear, output layer is clear. The hidden layer is, uh, this is called hidden layer because it's really hidden. We don't see what's happening inside. We just, we just um, provide the, the formula and, and that's it. We don't need to worry about what things will happen inside here. And uh, we usually don't even see, it's hard to see what's happening inside. And, uh, and, and, to, and just between parentheses, and that's kind of a downward or, or, or a disadvantage of neural networks. Some people do not like this, the fact that they don't see what's happening inside, uh, and, uh, but it depends on the application, okay? So input layer, hidden layer, and output layer. Okay, so applications, the applications are really endless and it's getting, uh, like I said, attention more and more. But these are a few examples. Um, so the, if we say the input is home features, uh, just like the example we, we, uh, we illustrated, and the output is the price, application is in real estate. It would be nice if, we, if some investor would uh, um, be able to predict the price of a house, in, for example, um, you know, down in six months. That would be really nice for, for, for the investor. Uh, okay, so that's the, that's the first example. Um, so in advertisement, digital uh, marketing, digital advertisement, we have the input is the ad and the user info, user info, the age, for example, the, uh, the gender, uh, area, I don't know. Just, just the user user information, and the output that we predict or we want to predict is given this input whether that person will click on the ad or not. So if the probability of that person given this input is to click on the ad is high, then we probably want to promote that user to um, to that ad. And this is used a lot in online ad advertising in Google, for instance. It's is one of the major uh, sources of their income. Uh, okay, so the images, uh, okay, so if the input is image and the output is the object, just like the example that we saw, uh, we, we insert the image and we train the network to say whether it's a cat or dog, um, and this is called in photo tagging. tagging. Um, if the input is audio and the output is text, Transcript, this is called in speech recognition. You have seen like, for example, uh, the caption, the, the automatic caption in YouTube, for instance. Uh, um, you, uh, if you have a video, uh, you turn on the caption, it automatically uh, translates the, the, the speech of that or the, the audio in that video uh, into uh, transcript, text transcript. And if the input, for example, is English and the output is French, this is, called, this is used in machine translation. These are applications in NLP, natural language processing. This is also a very uh, hot topic these days and there is a lot of uh, improvement, advancement in this field is going on. And uh, lastly, if we input the image and radar info and the position of the cars around us is the output, 
this is called this is used in autonomous driving of course that's a very complex system but one of the major um, algorithms and uh, uh, technologies that's being used is just using the image and radar info and uh, so that we can get uh, a sense where are the cars and the objects uh, around us okay so these are some of the applications okay so we just we talked about uh, up to here we just we're just talking about neural network neural network in general but the topic or the subject of our um, uh, workshop today tonight is deep learning or deep neural neural network so what are the deep neural networks okay so we go back to wikipedia and see how they define deep neural networks uh, wikipedia says a deep neural network is an artificial neural network with multiple layers between the input and output layers um, some words become fancy and uh, they are like become buzzwords uh, and uh, this is what's happening with deep learning uh, if you ask someone what is deep learning they say they think it's you know they get excited it's a very fancy name but in fact deep learning and deep neural networks are nothing but a neural, a, a very a simple neural network, but with a lot of, uh, I mean, the input even here doesn't matter, but a lot of hidden layers and, uh, and input layers. Okay, so the way they describe it here, uh, I do not fully agree, but the, the idea is clear. So we have a lot of layers. Uh, instead of just having a single or a couple of layer, we have multiple. Sometimes there, there are networks that have thousands of layers uh, in, in their heart of the network. So, so the DNN finds the correct mathematical manipulation to turn the input into the output, whether it be re uh, linear relationship or nonlinear. Okay. So that's about deep neuron. So the, the 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 message here is that deep learning or deep neural network is nothing but a regular or simple neural network stacking a lot of layers in between that's um, that's the idea of deep network or deep neural networks uh, so the question comes here why deep learning why is this word being so popular these days um, especially with knowing that neural networks have been they're out there since 60s, or even some literature um, um, suggests that they have been there in 50s. Uh, neural networks are, are that old. They have been there and people have been using them. So in 60s and 70s and maybe mid um, 80s, they have been very popular, the neural networks. But after uh, maybe mid 80s, uh if you look at the literature you will see that this these neural networks uh, slowly lost the interest from the researchers and the reason or the main reason was that neural networks are computed computationally expensive it takes a very long time to train a network a train a neural network especially if you have more layers and so they were at that time they were very limited uh, by um, computational power and the you know supercomputers did not exist even the uh, the regular pcs and computers uh, were not as powerful as these days so at some point they found out that okay if they want to solve a complicated and complex problem and they want to use a lot of layers they can't simply because they don't have the computational power that's why um, in mid, from mid 80s, uh, you will see that um, researchers really lost interest in, to neural networks. But later in, uh, I would say 2000 and, uh, and more, uh, from I would say 2000, 2005, and after the improvement of computing power, uh, neural networks uh, atten uh, grabbed the attention of um, of uh, researchers again, and this, uh, and I, maybe that was a trick that they used to just attract more people. They just 
uh, called this called it deep learning they because they had the ability to add a lot of layers a lot of hidden layers so um i think there was a nice trick to just give it a fancy word, fancy um fancy name deep learning and it really picked up from there and since then it's been at, uh, there are a lot of improvements i just give you one example if you remember this is something that we all experienced like five, six years ago, uh, when we were talking um, uh, like uh, on Android uh, phones, uh, the, the speech to text uh, uh, translation or the speech to text um, uh, uh, conversion was very poor. And a lot of times it's used, I mean, it was useless basically, because in, if you wanted to use your voice to write a, a text, it was full of mistakes. But if you see right now, uh, maybe in English, maybe they are close to, if, if there is no noise and there is no, and the, the person talks properly, it's close to 100% accuracy. And, uh, and that's all because um, uh, researchers were able to uh, train very deep neural networks where they can detect a lot of, um, features from the audio in this case and uh, uh, and that was the result so they have been very powerful tool and they are very uh, very much uh, popular these days okay so with that just an introduction now we get into uh, the second part we'll talk about the basic basic building plus uh, building blocks of a neural network all right so from here, I will just jump into some mathematics. Uh, I hope that it doesn't get you bored. Again, we will not get deep into it, but I hope that you can um, at least, even, uh, even if you don't under fully understand what's, what's happening, uh, because it's really hard in this, in this two hours, we want to have hands-on um, uh, uh, session and as well as the theory, it will not, we will not have time. I'll just quickly go through it uh, with the hope that you can at least grab um, the, the overall idea of uh, what's going on. And so uh, before jumping into what's, what's going on inside the neural network, I will start with a simple um, uh, model, which is called logistic regression. You might have heard about logistic regression. It's one of the very uh, popular uh, uh, techniques in classification for binary classification all right so uh, so binary classification problem is that when we are given an input in this case a, a picture of a cat or two cats in this case uh, that's our input and we want to see whether it's a cat or not a cat so that's why it's binary so it has only two outputs a cat if it's a cat we want the model to produce one. And if it's not a cat, we want the model to produce zero. That's why it's binary, one or zero, okay? And uh, so that's our Y. Again, the same thing. We stack all the, all the uh, values into one single column. And uh, in this case, let's say we have, uh, so if, if our picture is 64 pixel by 64, the height and width, it will be 64 by 64, and because we have three channels, it will be a, um, that, that will be the length of this vector, okay? Uh, 12,288, 12, and we call this n sub x, okay? Again, uh, I don't want to emphasize annotations because there is no really time, because if we want to go through all the math and all the calculation, it will take us a lot of time. Anyways, so, so that's a binary classification. And uh, yeah, so this slide, I just put it because uh, I'll be using um, this gentleman's uh, notes a lot uh, from here. Uh, so I just wanted to introduce him and Mr. Andrew Ng. He is actually, I think at the moment, he is number one in the field of computer vision and deep learning. He's very famous. People in this field have, um, I'm sure that you have heard of him. <clears throat> and here is his bio. Uh, so I just put his picture because I will be using his notes. Okay, so uh, this is again from Andrew Ng, uh, Andrew Ng notes. 
uh, the, and, and then at the beginning, he wants to define the notation that he will be using. So we have X and Y is our input. X is our training examples, for example, in, for example the size uh, and the number, of, uh, the, the number of bedrooms, the postal codes, these are our inputs. Uh, y is the, uh, is the, or in the, in, the, uh, in the example of the cat or not cat, X is the image, and Y is the binary variable one or zero, whether it's a cat or not, okay? So X is in uh, an R and X, because we have NX, if you remember here, we said NX is the size of the input vector. We stack, we stack all these uh, matrices into a very, uh, into a single vector, and this will be, the length of that x uh, of that uh, vector and we call this uh, nx n sub x that's why x belongs to uh, the re re real numbers uh, with and the dimension will be nx and y is 0 and 1 because it's a binary classification problem and we assume that we have m small m training examples meaning we have uh, m images all right so this is one image, maybe we have another image, another image, another image of different, different pictures of cats and non-cats. And th these are, if we count them, this will be M, okay? So we have M training examples. And he uses this uh, superscript one to just say X1 refers to the, uh, to the input of the first training example. Y1 is the label of the first training example and so on, okay? And if we stack all these training examples into one matrix, uh, he denotes that matrix in, with M, capital M, okay? So M train is the, uh, the, the, the mat this matrix for the uh, training examples for the training data set, and we have some test data set where we want to test it, and then he calls it M test, okay? Again, um, since we will not go deep into the calculation, there is no time. Um, I will not just spend a lot of time explaining the notation again. Uh, but just to, um, for, for those who are more interested, if we, st as, uh, if we just stack all the X's, so X1, the first training example, and then the X2, second training example, remember, this is, the, so, the, so the number of rows will be nx because each, each picture has nx number of entries. So this is the first picture, this is the second picture, and all the way to the mth picture. If we put all this in one single, um, um, one single matrix, we'll end up with uh, so-called the design matrix, uh, and uh, which will have m columns, number of pictures with NX rows. This is the dimension of our input, okay? And if we put all our labels in one single uh, long vector, it will be, um, uh, it will look like this and we, we, we call that capital Y. So uh, this might be zero. Remember, Y is either zero or one. So if the first picture is not a cat, this will be zero. The second picture is a cat, is this will be one, and, uh, and so on, okay? And, uh, uh, okay, so Y is in our uh, one times M because it's one row with M columns, and that's the shape of the Y, and that's the shape of the X, okay? So that's a notation which will be used. And um, so in order to understand the, like I said, um, in order to understand the neural network, we start with a simple model, which is logistic regression. So in logistic regression, just very quickly, if I want to explain what logistic regression is a um, modeling technique that's used for binary classification. So we are given the X, the inputs, and in logistic regression, the way it works Given x, we want to uh, find the probability of y equals one given x. All right. 
So this is what we want, and we should just we can call it y hat. They usually use this hat uh, for the prediction. So we know this input, and we want to see, given this information, what's the probability? Okay, going back to the cat problem, we are given a picture. That would be our um, our uh, input, right? The picture of we don't know if it's a cat or not. Uh, I mean, the computer doesn't know. So we are given a picture, that's our x, and we want to find the probability of uh, y being one. So y being one means the probability of this picture, given this picture, what's the probability that it's a cat? All right, so this is, uh, that's all it means here. So, of course, the y hat, y hat will be, uh, uh, since it's a probability, it will be between zero and one. For those uh, who have taken uh, probability courses, this is obvious. Uh, for those who haven't taken, just take it as a fact. So, uh, but how, this, how does this happen? How do we, just given an X, some information, uh, in this case, a picture, how do we calculate this probability? Logistic regression, again, without going uh, into the calculation, how this is for formulated, the way it works, because it's a linear classifier, uh, at the end of the, um, of the calculation, we will come up with some weights, W, I just say W transpose, which we multiply it by this input, and we hope that this will give us the answer, okay? I give you an example. Let's say, okay, just forget about the the cat uh, problem at the minute, uh, at, the, uh, at, at the moment, okay? Let's say we want to, let's say we want to, um, we are given, we go back to the house housing um, um, example, but let's say that we want, we don't want to predict the price of the house, we want to just predict that whether uh, that house is, um, I don't know, is livable or not. Is it, does it, is it worth uh, living in there or not? Uh, I just made that up because that would be a binary uh, output. So we are giving the size, number of bedrooms, for example, and, um, zip or postal code. Let's just stick with these three, okay? Um, so we are having these, and then we want to find out whether that y is one or not. So if y is one, we, we conclude that this house with this information is livable. If y is zero, then we say that, okay, it's not, uh, it's not livable. Let's say the size is uh, 1,050, for example, um, and number of bedrooms is five. Um, we just have to convert this zip code to some binary. I mean, let's just give it a score. Don't worry about how it works. Let's uh, just give it a score of seven, for example. So given this will be my X, Okay, I want to find a set of weights, W. So if I put these in a, if I put these in a vector, I will have, these are my information, okay? And I want to find um, a weight associated with size, a weight associated with number of bedrooms and a weight associated with the zip code. So that when I, so this is one by three vector, this is three by one. If I multiply it, I will have a single number, right? Okay, so I want to, so, I, but right now, you see that if I have a number here, a number here, and a number here, then I, I, when I multiply, I will get a number, okay? This number, hopefully, is the probability of that 
a house being livable, right? But how do we find these weights? And this is uh, all about uh, machine learning to just, because we said we want to find these weights in order to um, this, uh, so that this model works as a human brain, okay? How do you find these weights? This is, uh, again, we don't have time to go through this, but let's say that we can find a way to find, uh, we, we find a way that finds the best W's, this best set of W's that, if, uh, that produces the best answer here, okay? Let's just assume it for now. Uh, if we find this, that would be great because later on, if we have these numbers, if we are given any input, okay, let's say this, we are done with this uh, house, we, we get another house with different size, with different number of bedrooms, with different zip, all we need to do is just put it here, multiply it with the set of numbers that we have, and get the answer, okay? So, uh, so that's about finding Ws. So let's say that, going back to here, going back to here, um, uh, we want to find a set of Ws that we, when we multiply by X, it will provide us with the best answer. And usually, um, if you are familiar, uh, because this will be a straight line, um, W transpose times X will be a straight line, and usually they add a bias term because you know if you draw a, a line if the line goes through the or, or, or origin you don't the bias will, will be zero right so in this case it's zero b is zero but a lot of times you need so if your data points are here that's fine you don't need a bias term but if you your um data are here are sitting here it's not a good idea to just have a line that goes through the origin but the better line would be a line that goes to here with some bias so that's why you see w transpose x plus b uh, is the uh, the model that we are looking at okay but looking at this here the, if we multiply w by these numbers we will not get a number between zero and one, right? Remember, we are looking at the probability of y being one given the information, right? If we multiply it this way, we will not get a, a number that which is between zero and one. That's why we use something called sigmoid function, all right? Let me just get rid of some of these. Um, how can I do it? I should have used a better way, but anyway. Okay, almost there. Okay, so going back to here. So going back to here, we want to find this. Uh, we said that this is a this will be uh, the equation of a line, right? And it will not produce a number between zero and one, which we hope um, uh, to get that because to get to this this number, number we want to end up with a number between zero and one. Uh, this will not do the job. Therefore, we use something called sigmoid function. So whatever number here we pass it to, uh, let me just put this back here. We have W transpose X plus B. Whatever is here, we pass it to a function called sigmoid. And they use um, sigma for, for sigmoid, all right? 
what sigmoid is is the following uh, here in this picture you see how the sigmoid function uh, looks like if you draw it uh, so this is the equ equation of a sigmoid a sigmoid of a variable will be one over one plus e to the negative z z is the so it, this x axis i call the variable z and uh, the sigmoid function takes that input variable and does this with it so one over one plus e to the negative z it has a very nice um, it has very nice characteristics uh, if you do the math uh, you will see that that's why it got very much uh, you know people got interested in this because it has some this function mathematically has very nice in um, characteristics and properties okay and the good thing is that just don't worry about the this here but it will be the the regular sigmoid will be between one and zero with the middle part going through point five okay so if i take this function whatever it is and apply sigmoid so it will be one over one over one plus e to the negative w transpose x plus b all right if i do that i will get a number between zero and one i will definitely get a number between zero and one and that number will be the probability of uh, getting a one given that information the probability of the picture the input picture being a cat uh, is found that is found through this uh, equation okay and why is this working because if you look at this uh, if if i call just if i just call this uh, z this change the pen color if i call this z if z is large just take a look at this function if if z is large if z is very large this will be e to the negative very large large number so this will be zero okay e to the negative very large number is zero so we end up with one over one and we get one almost one okay and same thing if z is very large negative number again the same thing it will be uh uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so, so if if z is a large negative, uh, the same thing will happen, okay. And uh, if 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 z is zero, we'll get if z is zero, we'll get one over one plus e to the zero is one, and that's one half, and that's why you see. Uh, whenever uh, the function passes through uh, zero, its value is one half. Okay, so again, um, maybe I hope you, you didn't get bored, but um, I hope that you appreciate the, uh, the sigmoid function and how the logistic regression works. So how, we, uh, how do we, um, uh, okay, so let's say that we apply the logistic regression to all the examples that we have and we get a y hat for each and every training example so if this is my x um, picture one picture two picture all the way to picture m i will get a set of y hat for each of them right uh, how do we want to uh, optimize and how do we want to find the best set of weights and this is what, uh, where the people use a cost function. Again, this is a, uh, these are like uh, fundamentals of any, uh, any machine learning uh, model. You, um, you have a, you have a uh, cost function. I will just dis uh, define what is the, fun uh, what is the, uh, cost function for logistic regression and quickly just talk about why this works so recall that this is the y hat 
if we say that this is for the i training example and uh, for the y hat okay so uh, remember we are having we are dealing with some pictures some x's we want to learn this function through these examples but we do have access uh, because this is supervised learning we do have access to the label so we know that the first picture will be a cat the second one is not a cat but of course so we want to use this information to find the best set of w's and of course b okay how to do that of course we want we want our y hat for each training for each picture the one that we predict we want it to be equal to the real one that's the goal i mean that's the whole goal of doing the machine learning because we want whatever we want to predict we want it to be true that's why this is what we want so um you can define some so-called loss function i will just introduce it really quick without again going into any uh, deep math but the loss function is the one that you if people here anybody here has taken any um, um uh, optimization course you are familiar with the optimization techniques so this is my function uh, the the loss function is a function of y hat my prediction and y the real value and this is how it's defined so it's negative y log log of y hat um and plus one minus y log of one minus y okay where is this cost function coming from um some smart people thought about whoever did the logistic regression so they sat down and they found they came up with this amazing loss function and i will explain in a minute what this means okay so just looking at this function um if just just for a minute just imagine how this works let me just change this to maybe red okay if y is equal to one when i say y is y is the la the true label okay so y, if y is equal to one, then see what happens. This part is gone because, uh, sorry, sorry. If y is equal to one, how can I? If y is equal to one, the second part is gone because you say one minus one if y is one, this becomes zero, and then zero times this is zero. So you end up with only negative y log y hat, all right? And if y is zero, the, the true label is zero, this part is gone. And you end up with, um, and so this if, if y is zero this becomes one and one times log of one minus y hat will be log of one minus y hat okay so in this case when y is one if you look at the sigmoid function we want if y is one we want so remember this is given and we want to find this if y is one we want this to be large we want the y hat to be large and uh, if y is zero we want y hat to be small because if you plug in a very um, if you if you plug in a large number of course remember this is between zero and one and that so so y hat in this case will be close to to y and that's the goal because remember we want to have our y hat to be very close uh, or better to say almost equal to y okay so if you look at this and you work the math it will be um, 
you'll see that how beautifully things work, uh, work out here. And uh, of course, uh, in real, so this is only for one example, for one data set or, or for one observation, for one picture. Uh, if we want to uh, do the same thing for the for all the training examples, we can design. Uh, we can just define J of W and B to be one over M, because we want to average through all the training examples. Okay, uh, that's why we divide everything by M. So this will be one over M uh, sum. We sum through all the training examples, all the pictures, all the houses in our X here. So this will go from one to M. The loss function for each training example versus the real value of that exam. Okay. Of course, you can write this down. You can plug this in and you work the math, but we are not going to do that. Okay, so this is the basic building block of how the logistic regression works. So if we optimize this function, if we optimize this function, we will end up with the best set of W and B uh, that works best here. Oh. Works best here. We find these set of parameters. These are called parameters, okay? That's why you use a loss function as a way to find uh, the to find the, uh, the the best or the optimized values for W and B. Okay. Um, with that, let's move on. Uh, okay. So how do we optimize this function? Okay. Uh, let me just. Okay. We got we we call we got this number now. Th this function. All right, it's a function of W and B. Uh, we have all the formula. We can just plug in the, this formula here, from here, and just plug it in here. Uh, sum over all of them, but how do we find, how do we optimize it? How do you find the best set of Ws and Bs? This is um, uh, an optimization problem, and uh, uh, it's called one of, I mean, there are techniques uh, for, for to, to, in order to calculate or to optimize that value. And one of the most popular techniques is called gradient descent. The gradient descent is that, uh, so let's say, okay, let me just before getting, getting to this, let, let me, let me um, say what do we mean by optimization? What do we mean by finding the best of a set of Ws and Bs? So just imagine for a minute that if we draw so remember here we found we derived a function a function which hopefully is the correct and it's proved to be the correct loss function for the logistic regression let's just assume for a minute that if we draw this using a computer program uh, or a advanced calculator we get something like this this is a function okay so this j w and b uh, so it has two uh, two uh, 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 two uh, variables, right? So we have the B axis and W axis, and if we draw it, we end up something like this. When we say we want to minimize this function, it means that we want to find. So imagine, how did I? How, how do you um, plot this function? You just get. You get, you get, uh, you plug in a set of numbers for W and B, and so let's say if you if you you plug some W one and B one, you you get this point. If you plug W two B two, you get this point, and so on. So you end up with this shape. Okay, that's our function, and by minimizing the values, I want to find this point, which is the least or the smallest value of this function. Uh, so I wanna see which set of W and B will lead me to this point. That's what it means by optimization or minimization, okay? Again, people who have taken optimization classes are familiar with this. Um, so there are techniques, one of the most popular techniques is called gradient descent. 
uh, again, there is no time to go through what it means, or maybe just uh, quickly here. Uh, so let, let's just assume that this is my function. This is my function, and I want uh, to minimize to find this point. Okay. Of course, when I am given this function, I don't know what is this point. So I start somewhere in this um, in this uh, function, and if I calculate the so if this is j of w. This is, if this is a function, um, if I calculate the slope of this function at this point, um, it's called the gradient. So if I, it turns out that if you find the gradient, if the gradient here at this point, evaluated at this point, is uh, greater than zero, then you decide to move to this direction. Whereas if you start here and you calculate the slope, at this point, the gradient at this point, and of course it will give you the value will be less than zero, and that's when you try to increase w in order to um, to approach this point. This uh, uh, this point. This is a property of uh, of uh, the the derivative, so called the derivative. Okay. Um, so uh, with that. Um, uh, we uh, we move so we, we we so of course again we don't know what is this point we start somewhere we calculate the gradient and hopefully we slowly take steps steps after steps and hopefully we reach to this point if we reach to this point in the next iteration if we calculate the gradient we will see that this will be uh, we are doing worse that's why we stop here okay so this is in high level. Uh, how the, the the optimization and gradient descent work? Uh, again, without going into uh, any any um, details. So the way the 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 way that we want to optimize and calculate the best set of Ws and Bs is that we uh, we feed this cost function into an optimization um, uh, uh, engine. Let's just call it and find these numbers. Okay. So um, uh, I don't know if we have time to, um, to go through the intuition. I just assume that in your calculus, you know what a, deriv you know what a derivative is. So basically, at, at, so just, let me just give you an example. Uh, let's, let's say we have this, um, this line. If we draw it, this is, so this is, I just call this variable A, it can be X. So if, I, if it's x, uh, it will be f of x because x usually is used, so maybe it's more familiar. So f of x is 3x. If I draw it, I will have this line, right? So if, let's say if I want to evaluate um, the, so let's say this is two, okay? So the value in, in this axis is two. If I calculate f of two, it will be three times two, which is six, right? Let's say that I uh, move this value to a tiny bit, okay, a tiny bit. So let's say I just move it from two to 2.001 for the sake of illustration, okay? And now let's, uh, let's ca uh, calculate what happens to the value of f of, f of two. If I do that, I will say f of two, zero, zero, one will be three times this value. So it will be, just, I don't wanna make silly mistakes. So let's just punch it in here. It will be six point, zero zero three as you can see i just plugged in numbers f of x is, so any x is given you uh, it's good it, it, it will get multiplied by um, by x so f of two will be three times two six f of 2.001 is 6.003 so let's see what happened now when we moved by one unit let's just call 
0.001, one unit on the x-axis, or in this case, a-axis, okay? What happened was that I just moved it by one unit, okay? And by moving one unit in this direction, my value in this direction from, uh, so from, from in the x direction, I moved from two to, to 2.001, but in y direction, what happened was that my function moved from six to 6.003. So what just happened was that here, the, um, uh, so by moving in, in, in one direction in X, I got, uh, by increasing X by one unit, I got my Y increased by three units. So from 6.000, I got 6.003. And it turns out that this is, this is the slope of this line. If we cal calculate the, uh, the slope of this tiny value in this, uh, in this, uh, section, it will be the slope of this, uh, of this tiny piece, okay? Uh, and this is the idea behind the derivative. The, the derivative is that this how the function changes when you move x there in a very, very, very tiny, 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 tiny um, uh, unit to the right, okay? So let's say if uh, our unit instead of being zero zero one, it's zero 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 one, and that's the definite. That's that's how the you get the intuition of derivative. Okay, that's why we say if you plug in any number. Okay, let's just try another number. If I plug number nine, f of nine will be three times nine, twenty seven. Okay, and if I uh, move nine by one tiny unit, 9.001, okay, this again will be uh, three times 9.001, it will be 27.001. Same thing, so I moved A by one unit, and I got my y moved by three units. Remember, our units is 0 0.00, okay? So when uh, we have a linear function like this, this is what happens. That's why we say the derivative of f of a with respect to a, or dA, they call it, is three because no matter what you do, no matter which number you plug in here, if you move in one unit in a direction, you will end up having uh, your y um, uh, changed with three units, okay? So that's, that's the derivative. That's how you calculate the derivative, okay? The derivative is the, the amount uh, of change in your y value, when your x is moved one unit uh, to the right, okay? One tiny, tiny, tiny unit. But here, so this was a, um, this was a, a, a linear function, but of course, if you have a nonlinear function like this, a squared, again, I'm not gonna plug in numbers, you can check it out, but if you check any number and uh, do the same thing that we did here, you will see that the change will be um, by, any number that you plug in, you will see that the change will satisfy this equation, two times a. Okay, so let's say if you have the f of, um, uh, just, uh, I, I'm not going to go through the example because there is no time, okay? Uh, but you can check it out, okay? And uh, if you want to see more derivatives, uh, and that's how we say, okay, so here in this example, d f of a, the derivative of f of a, which is, a squared with respect to a will be two times a, okay? Now, um, I mean, this is purely calculus. You can just refer to any calculus uh, uh, textbook and find what are the derivatives for different functions. So um, again, I will skip this. And coming to how things works. Okay, so just now if we put things together, 
uh, in the logistic regression, uh, we, use a, we said that we use a derivative to find the best set of weights. So this is how it works. So we input the, uh, the so these will be the input. We calculate W, so this is nothing but W transpose, transpose X plus B. And then here, the output will be a, sig a sigmoid applied to this value. And after that, we calculate the loss, okay? So once we calculate the loss at this point, this is called backward propagation. Backward propagation is nothing but an iteration that you, you calculate these derivatives. You, you, you calculate the derivative of A with respect to the loss function. And then uh, using the chain rule here, you calculate the derivative of Z with respect to the loss function. A lot of calculus, a lot of math, I know. Um, uh, sorry if it just gets boring. But I just wanted you to understand what is a back propagation. Again, we are talking about logistic regression. We are not talking about any um, uh, neural network uh, at the moment, but the, you will see that this is the base of it. So we start with some W and then, so that's why it's an iterative algorithm. You iterate and in each iteration you update, you end up, you, so you start with some random numbers for W. So maybe zero, zero, one, okay? And for your B, just, you just assume that it's 0.5. You randomly initialize it, and then you iterate through, um, and, and each, in each iteration, you calculate these derivatives, and you update your W according to these formulas. So W will be W, so if this is W new, will be w1 or the w old minus alpha alpha is the learning rate and i will, I will explain that in a minute times the dw is times the derivative of w1 same thing for w2 and same thing for b okay so if we do this enough times enough iterations we hopefully arrive to a set of w's and b's that are that optimize our cost function in simple word we arrive to W's and B's, which are the best for our data, okay? So this learning rate uh, is going back to here. Uh, I said that we start with somewhere, this is, this is random initialization. So I just, let's say that I picked up this point and every time I calculate the derivative, I decide to move towards the direction of, uh, of this point. But how much, what is the step? So if I take a large step, imagine what happens. Um, if I take a large step, uh, let's say I start here, I take this step, and then this step, and then I take another larger step, so I miss this point, all right? If I miss this point, um, I might not, my algorithm might not converge. But if I take right um, just enough uh, um, um, size of a step, I hopefully go slowly and arrive at this point. Of course, there is a cost associated with each um, uh, of these uh, um, uh, techniques. If you take a large step, you may miss this point, but your algorithm, you arrive earlier to this hopefully if you arrive it will be faster it will go move faster as you can see less steps you need but here it will be slow but hopefully you will not um, miss the um, the minimize the, the, the point that minimizes your function okay um i think we had enough math uh and i think we are out of time so again i will not go through uh, these um this these stuff need you know maybe a course by itself, but um, if we just think about okay here I will just quickly explain. Uh, we just learned how the logistic regression works, and how do we arrive to the best set of Ws. Now neural networks are nothing but so if we think of this as a simple logistic regression, 
where inside this neuron, we have a sigmoid function, which takes these inputs and calculates W transpose oh, X, supposed to be X plus B. Um, so this is a single logistic regression. If we stick a lot of these, that's in this case, three of these, and connect all these inputs together, and then we have, so these, so each neuron here, each neuron is a sigmoid function. So a sigmoid here, sigmoid here, sigmoid here. And it outputs a set of, um, so after feeding the input in each neuron, we will have an output from each neuron. And then we feed these outputs of these neurons to an output layer. Maybe we have another sigmoid here. and then we arrive to our answer, okay? So and the lesson I want you to remember is that uh, a neural network might be nothing but stacking a lot of these neurons, which each neuron is a simple logistic regression with a sigmoid function like this, okay? Of course, the, the derivation will be uh, involved more because at the, if we have, uh, at this point, we have to, uh, calculate the derivative for each input and in each step. So we'll have uh, a, set of a set of calculation here in, for this layer, for this layer. But the calculations, if we use same uh, sigmoid function as uh, what's so-called the activation function inside the neurons, the calculations will be the same, okay? But it will be happen more and more and more. Um, this is the same thing again. And uh, yeah, here is just saying that Andrew is trying to say that, okay, again, the same thing. We are feeding the input in, into the neuron, W transpose X plus B. He just calls this whole thing Z. And then Z, uh, we um, apply a sigmoid function to this Z and that will be the output of this node, okay? So the output of this node will be an input to another node maybe if we have another layer after this. So the output of this will be the input of this node, okay? And so on. So the output here will be the input of the second one and so on. And that's, that's how they, they, they build very large neural networks. So it goes and goes and goes until you hit to the output layer, which will be the last layer which will produce your, um, your result, your prediction, okay? Um, let's just move fast because, um, yeah, this stuff will take time to be to, to explain. Okay, just activation functions. Uh, I will just quickly explain here. Uh, so hopefully we have time to, to move into the hands-on part. Okay, so the activation functions, we just talked about it. Uh, sigmoid is just one type of the active, activation function, okay? Uh, but uh, nowadays, uh, almost they, they almost never use sigmoid in hidden layers. Uh, they usually use either tanh, which is a different, another, another function. This is, so this is sigmoid. This, is, this drawing is sigmoid. This is tanh. Tanh is having a, uh, it has a different for, uh, formula. This is called, uh, this is used a lot in, in the, um, but the idea is the same. It's just in, when you use sigmoid, this is the function. When you use tan H, this is the function. And um, most, uh, uh, and this tan H is also being, uh, you know, people are not using it anymore uh, or rarely use it, using it. And a lot of people move to what's so-called ReLU function. ReLU uh, is called, uh, uh, stands for rectified linear unit is very simple but very effective function is nothing but the max of zero is uh, zero and z uh, don't worry about how, how it you know how it works but um, this is called ReLU. or if you read the literature you will uh, see they use this a lot ReLU. okay but why do we need an activation function here so activation function, these are called activation functions. 
tan H uh, sigmoid. Oh, by the way, the, uh, the sigmoid uh, is usually used in the last uh, output layer because, because it's a nice way to produce probabilities, okay? So usually the people use uh, either sigmoid or uh, higher, I mean, a different version of sigmoid, which is called softmax. Uh, in this uh, last layer, because because the output of a sigmoid, we said it will be a number between zero and one, and that's usually what we want. Here we use different activation functions, but here we use sigmoid. Okay, but why do we need? Or why why do we um, use activation functions? It turns out that if we don't use activation functions, everything will be linear. So if we we cannot capture so let's say our data is like this, okay? Our data is like this. Okay, so this is my x axis and this is my y axis. If, uh, if I use a linear function, I can't, I can't really fit this data very good. I mean, the best I can do maybe something like this, right? That's why I need a nonlinear function to kind of find the right pattern for this data. So hopefully fit a function like this. And it turns out that we can't do that. Uh, it turns out that if we use um, linear functions here, you can't capture this nonlinearity. That's why people use uh, nonlinear, that's why people use activation functions in order to capture this uh, nonlinearity. Um, Okay, this, in these slides, Andrew is, um, is deriving the derivative formulas for each of these uh, activation functions. We don't have time. Uh, by the way, this is called leaky ReLU. This is also being uh, popular. So in regular ReLU, um, anything before, uh, anything be less than zero will be zero, but in leaky ReLU, uh, it will be max of, instead of zero, we have 0 0.01 times Z. Again, let's not worry about it. Okay, so with that, all that being said, we come to, now I think we have a good understanding of what is a deep neural network. It's just, so if we started off with a simple logistic regression, and then we said, okay, how does a one hidden, how does the network works with one hidden layer, and we said that uh, the, the logic is the same, the um, math, if we use the sigmoid function is the same, uh, but this involves a little bit more. And if we add another layer, it will be more complex. And of course, if we add, for instance, five hidden layers, then maybe we can call our network a deep network because we have a lot of, layers in between and we'll see why. So why do we need a deep representation? Why do we not just use this? It's much, much simpler. Um, so the answer is that the more complex the problem is, the more hidden layers you, you need. For example, if you want to do a face recognition. So uh, the first layer, the, when you feed in the picture, the first layer just detects uh, high level information in the picture. Maybe it finds the, the edges uh, and like circle here. So this, this, is, this is done in the first layer. In the second layer, you get to, um, to uh, detect uh, and catch more features like the eye and the nose and uh, I don't know, like more, more, more uh, low level features and the more deeper you go you get to um, you get to uh, um, to capture uh, much more details about the input in this case the image and that's why the more complex the the task is the more hidden layers you need <clears throat> in order to be able to um, to correctly um, identify and and recognize in this case the picture okay and for instance, in audio uh, or speech recognition, maybe the first layer um, just captures a low level audio bandwidth. And then, um, and then maybe in the next layer, it just finds some, the, 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 the word, the, uh, the uh, what you call it, the, the letters. 
and uh, next layer finds the words and then uh, at the end it just puts everything together the sentence okay okay uh, let's move on we don't have time so we we said that in, we just kind of talked about what is a backward back or back propagation it was uh, calculating the derivatives and the forward propagation is that once we calculate these derivatives we again calculate these values um, just in a high level again i don't have time to go through it so we have forward propagation we calculate these values and then in the backward propagation or back propagation we calculate these derivatives and update these values okay that's that's all uh, you need to know for now all right and uh, okay so we said okay so in every um, neural network or basically in any machine learning we have some set of parameters in this case we talked about our w's w1 b1 w2 b2 and so on these are our parameters but we have some hyper parameters as well the hyper parameters for example the learning rate what is a good um, value for learning learning rate number of iterations how how many iterations we should uh, uh, go through the um, the algorithm in order to find uh, to minimize our function number of hidden layers how many hidden layers is uh, is proper and number of hidden units in each hidden layer and so on and the choice of activation so these are called hyperparameters okay and at the end i just need to mention that or andrew mentions that applied deep learning is a very empirical process so you start with an idea you start coding and you test your code and uh, you find out whether so you need to fine-tune your uh, it's very hard to just kind of optimize all these high parameters and hyper parameters usually it takes you by um, uh, uh, trial and error to in order to find the best set of hyper parameters the parameters of course is we just saw that it's a very uh, is mathematical um, it has a mathematical foundation uh, you don't need to worry about this the math takes care of these but the hyperparameters is usually fine-tuned by the user okay i think uh, we it took me more than what i expected but um, let's let's practice okay and with that um, I don't know, should I keep it? Okay. So, uh, I sent you the, the, the link. Okay. Uh, I see the notes now. Um, uh, so here, uh, the collaboration, um, uh, the, the Google Collab is a very um, nice, uh, uh, very nice um, tool that you can uh, run your code and you can also collaborate with others. And, and this is where uh, what we'll be using. So if you open this link, you land in this page. Let's I think I have a problem with my internet. Um, okay. 
I'm not sure if you still can see my. Hello. Okay, can can we can can somebody just uh, say oh somebody's asking if I can send the link. Okay. Yes, doctor. Okay. Yes. Is everything okay? I just wanted to uh, double yes, check yes, to yes. see. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Audible. Yeah. Okay. And we can hear you also. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. Now, so if we if you go to this page, um, this is the um, the code that we'll be using. Of course, I'll be using um, uh, Python for the code, and I'll be using um, uh, Keras as the uh, as the uh, the the package. If you can just allow me one second. Just a second. Okay. Okay. So the way it, uh, so the way Google Collab works, you just need to um, to uh, link it with your Google account, and um, just you can write the code. And uh, if you have worked with uh, Jupyter Notebook, it's very much similar to Jupyter Notebook, um, but you can just share it uh, just like a Google document, for instance. All right. So. Here, um, I'm just importing the packages. If I just run this part, um, again, I'm using Keras. Keras is one of the uh, most famous um, uh, packages for uh, deep learning in uh, Python. Uh, Keras is actually, a, uh, I mean, the, a very, it's, it's a high level um, package, um, uh, compared to TensorFlow, it's 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 based on TensorFlow, uh, but it's um, it's a, it's like a more high higher level than TensorFlow, and um, so if I run this part, um, um, I have just here I have um, um, loaded my packages. Uh, you can do this with me if you have it ready, and. Uh, I will just skip this part because we will just uh, go right to the. So here I'm just showing you how to get. You can open a file in uh, in Google Collab, and uh, but we don't have time to go through this. So uh, I want you to just come to here, classification problem with Titanic data. Okay. Uh, so if I uh, if you run this part, we'll uh, so here we'll use the Titanic data again. The data is here. If you haven't uh, already downloaded it, uh, you can you can you can go to the chat and the the, the link to download the to access the data set are there. So um, the way the uh, Google Collab, if the way you uh, okay, I see why. Okay, because we need to first. Okay, so we we need this library. So I, I better move it to here. Okay. Now, now if I do this,
I can uh, take the, the OneDrive and here I can pick this one. All right. So once that's done, you need to write it or you need to read the CSV file um, with pandas. Um, I don't know. I think we are almost out of time. So I don't know whether we should stop here and just have another session for the practical uh, or hands-on part. What do you think, um, Dr. Zainab? Because uh, so I think yeah, we're recording. Uh, we'll make this data available later, so people who want to do it can continue watching um, after we upload the file. So you you're good to go if you're okay. Okay, because it, uh, I I just want didn't want to make it really uh, I didn't I didn't want to make it fast because we are, are, are almost uh, we only have fifteen minutes. So I was thinking maybe we can make another session, like one hour session, to just go, we take our time to go through the code. What do you think? Uh, so everybody here, I think, is waiting for the workshop or the hands-on workshop. So I would uh, highly suggest we continue, if you don't mind. OK. Right. OK. Thank you. All right. So let's, then, then let's do it. OK. So maybe we, we know that to, not to lose, lose that. The sequence is just to from here. So here I'm uh, loading the hourly wages data set. Again, you have it in your um, in your in the Google Drive. If you go by sequence, you will not run into problem. So after uh, loading the file, I just uh, read it because it, it's, it has, a, a, it's not like when you write the code in, um, you know, in local machine, it's a bit different. You need this extra package in order to read the data into Google, Google Cloud. So you need this package IO. And uh, you need you use this command to to read this data into a pandas data frame. So my df, I just have a I take a look at the head of the data. It's something like this, okay. And then next, um, uh, this is just another command to just describe the pandas data frame. Uh, and here it is. It has uh, so uh, the first column is wage per hour union, education years, experience years, and so on, okay? This is the data. So now uh, I want to show you how you can construct um, a neural network using Keras. So the first uh, line of code here, uh, I am just separating the, the predictors and the target. By target value, uh, I mean the value that you want to output, you want to predict, okay? Which in this case is wage per hour. So I, uh, I uh, exclude all the columns except for wage per hour, and that would be my predictors. It's just the same as the input X, and my Y, I just call the target, okay? Which is this column. And the third line of code, uh, I'm defining the, the, the um, the number of columns in predictors. This will be the dimension of my input, okay? So predictors, the shape uh, gives me the, um, the number of columns in my predictors. And, uh, and from here, I'm using Keras uh, library. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just, uh, just call, I just call it model. You can, it's just a variable name. And I initialize it as so, so I will be using sequential model. Don't worry what this means. Uh, it's just, it, it, just think about it as what we have been talking about, sequential, okay? So once I do that, I initialize a sequential model 
And then here, I add the first layer. I say model.add. Dense means a dense layer, if you, if you recall from the lecture. Uh, dense means all the uh, neuron units are connected to each other. Okay, so that's a dense layer. So dense layer, and then I define, I want 50 units inside the dense, um, uh, and inside the layer. So let me just go back to here. Here is layer, first layer, for example. And these are the units, one, two, three, four, five in this example, okay? So this is what I'm doing. I'm doing the first layer, and I want to have 50 neurons inside that layer. And then I specify my activation function. I want it to be ReLU. And I have to specify the input shape. And that's why we extracted this uh, number of points. So the input shape is the, the dimension of my input, okay? Then maybe we can add another uh, second layer. Same thing. You add a dense with 32 units and activation to be ReLU, okay? And at the end, we add uh, the, the output layer. It's the output will be a dense with one unit. Remember, usually the output is only one unit because that's the unit that will produce the, the, uh, the prediction, okay? So if I run this and I'm printing the model, uh, it just, you will see that this model I'm printing this object is a Keras sequential model. And this is just the address where it's sitting in the memory, okay? So that's how you construct a, a neural network easily with Keras, okay? Now we move to the next uh, data set, Titanic data set. And uh, here again, we do the same thing. We upload the file, choose file, and then I do, do Titanic all numeric. And uh, if you read the, um, I've, I've added uh, like text here to, to explain each step. So later on, you can refer to these texts to see what's going on in each step. Again, I'm gonna read it in, uh, I'm gonna read it in a pandas data frame. And I'm just printing the, the first uh, few uh, uh, observations of this data, okay? In this case, the target is survived, is the column survived, and the other columns are, um, uh, are the predictors. Uh, so survived is my Y, and uh, the others are my X. The other columns are my X. Uh, so coming to this, uh, code. Again, I'm doing, uh, I'm just uh, doing the same thing. So predictors will be everything except the survived column. The target, my Y will be the survived column. Um, and uh, uh, here, since my survived column is zero and one, I would like to, um, uh, to convert it to, to categorical. Uh, if you read the documentation for this, you will see why we do this, okay, in, in Python. And uh, so I do that, and then uh, I, again, get the number of columns, uh, initialize the model, and uh, add the first layer 32, uh, 30, with 32 units, and uh, the output layer will have two units uh, with a softmax, a softmax activation. Uh, we did not talk about softmax, but softmax is just um, um, is is used for uh, uh, when it's just the same as logistic or, or same as sigmoid, but you have you can do more than binary if you have multiple categories. You can do the same. So after building this. Uh, uh, this network, let me just do one thing. Let me this, run this, and put this here. Okay, so here, by running this uh, cell, 
I, I created or, or I generated my, uh, my uh, neural network. And then the next one, so once we have it, we just have it now, we have a model. We first need to compile it. By compiling, we mean we want to find the best W, the best parameters, what we have been talking about. So we'll compile it. We specify a type of optimization. Uh, SGD stands for um, uh, gradient descent, okay? Uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, there are other optimization techniques. They vary a little bit, but the foundation is the same that, that, that I explained. And the loss will be categorical cross entropy. This is a loss function um, that we talked about. And the metrics is accuracy because we want to uh, we want to compare or we want to get the highest accuracy. That's why we specify the metrics to be accuracy. And after compiling the model, we fit the model. We fit the model by fitting the model, we uh, feed in the predictors, our inputs, and the target, which is our output. So if I run this, you see that uh, it says, some output says epoch one of one. So epoch, I didn't say that in, if you see epoch, epoch is one iteration that, uh, you know, we, 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 because I mentioned that finding the optimized set of parameters is an iterative um, process. So each iteration is, an, is called an epoch, okay? And usually you need more than uh, one or you, you need a good number of uh, epochs in order to find your best parameters. Uh, here, it just provides some information. What it provides, so these are important. It provides the value of my loss function and it provides the accuracy. So I'm getting here for 57% accuracy, okay, on the training data. Next, um, next, just, let's just use the uh, function to predict. So I use 70% of the data to train this network. And I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna upload the remaining thirty percent. I called it Titanic test. These are the data that I want to predict. I want to test my model, how good it's predicting. Okay, and uh, I upload it and do the same thing. I read it to a pandas data frame, and I'm using this line of code model dot predict. And by providing the prediction data, which is this, this is my testing test data. I use model.predict to predict, to provide the pr prediction. And here I'm just extracting the probabilities. Um, again, if you read uh, the, the documentation, you will see how we can, you know, what this object looks like and you can extract the probabilities. And I'm printing the probabilities, okay? So if I do that, I get a set of numbers. Here it means that the first, the first uh, observation, the probability of being one is 66%. The probability of the second uh, observation being one is 49% and so on. So these are my probabilities. Of course, in practice, we usually turn these or convert these probabilities to zero and one. So you said a, a threshold, uh, let's say you th anything above 0.5 will be one and anything above, uh, below 0.5 will be zero. Okay. Now, here I did this, I just um, did this little function uh, and uh, the goal is to, to check and to assess or compare um, different models. So, I have written this function, get new model. This model, uh, it just creates a, a, an unoptimized model. And then in this for loop down here, we go, th um, we want to test how the optimization or how the performance of the network is for each, um, for uh, when we change the learning rate. So, I am setting three learning rates, a very, very small learning rate, 0 0.00001 and 0 0.001 and one. And we wanna see what happens. Uh, because if you remember um, in the lecture, uh, we want the just right learning rate because if the learning rate is so high, we may miss 
the, uh, the optimized um, value for our parameters. And, as, uh, and if it's very small, it will take so long, okay? Uh, for the sake of illustration, I'm just gonna do that. And here we can see. So with the testing model, with learning rate very small, we get a loss of 4.6, which is higher than um, the, the learning rate, which when the lear learning rate is 0 0.01. And of course, when the learning rate is one, you see that the loss function is very high. And remember, the goal is to, is to minimize this loss function. And so the lower the value, the better the result. And in this case, this very small learning rate couldn't even arrive or land into this, um, into this value. It did not have enough iteration to, uh, to find the best set of uh, parameters in order to minimize this loss function, okay? And uh, okay, and one of the common practices that people um, do is that they uh, they assess the model with a validation portion, validation set. Okay, uh, let me just take a look at the chat. Maybe. Nothing for me for now. Okay. Okay. Um, so we want. So what people do is that okay when they have a large data set, they assign portion a portion of it for validation. This helps them to optimize their number, and I will explain how this happens in a minute. So for now, let's say that we want to, we are creating this sequential model. I'm adding a layer with 100 units with activation value, with real activation. And uh, the second layer with 100, again, units with real activation. And, if, if, uh, and if an output layer with two uh, units and a softmax act activation, okay? So this is my model. I compile the model. Here is just uh, up to this point. Um, is just what we we did uh, previously, but now when I want to fit this model, I provide the x, I provide the y, and this argument. Now I say validation split equals 0.3. This means that okay, uh, when I want to optim when I want to optimize my function, I hold on to 30% in each iteration. I hold on to 30% of the data points and just optimize over the 70% 70, 70 and whatever values I get for my parameters, I test it on validation, validation data, okay? With what, this is very important step because, um, let me just run it and show you why it is important. Because you may easily run, especially with deep neural networks, you may easily run into something called overfitting. Again, people in machine learning uh, field, they, are, they know how, they are familiar with these terms. But here you see that it uh, prints the, uh, the value accuracy and the accuracy. So the accuracy is the accuracy on the training set, on the 70%. And the uh, validation accuracy is the accuracy of um, of, uh, on the validation set. Why is it important? Um, so if you do this for a lot of epochs, um, I think I have an example I will show you later, but when you, uh, in each epoch, uh, the, the computer program is printing these values. So you have to keep track of these values. So if you see that these, uh, the accuracy, for example, on the training set is very high, and the uh, accuracy of the uh, validation set is getting far from the, from the accuracy of the model, this means that your model is overfitting. Overfitting means uh, that you are fitting, you, are, you lose the power of generalization. So you are doing very good on your training data, but we don't want to use our model for training data. We want to use our model to test for the future. 
And if you see that these numbers do not match, then, that, then there is a problem. So this is a good diagnostic um, uh, tool. And then you can also add st uh, early stopping criteria uh, or add early stopping. I will not talk about it. Um, you can look it up and then you can just see the code. And here I'm just comparing different networks. I will just quickly uh, run it and show you. So here we, we try to compare two models, one with two hidden layers and one with 10. Okay, did we get an error? Ah. Because we need to run this first. Okay. Okay. And now. And I'm plotting how, how the two models are behaving. You see that the the model with um with uh, uh with wider uh with more uh layers. Uh, with more units, um, it, it, you, it, you barely are improving with using 100 units. So that's, that's, that's the way you decide on how many units. So the red line is the, the model with only 10 units. They both have one hidden layer. Uh, but we see that it's, even getting, it's doing a pretty good job. So you don't need to move to 100 units. So these are some ways and some techniques that people usually use in order to find what is the best uh, architecture. And the same thing, so that this one was about adding units to a layer and this is about uh, having more hidden layers. Uh, same thing, uh, again, I'm having two, two uh, models where I am comparing and okay, now you have to interpret uh, and you have to de decide which model to go with, okay? And lastly, I would like to show you uh, an example. I will be using this um, mnest.csv. These are handwritten um, data. These are the data contains the pixel values of 2,000 handwritten digits, maximum color stack size XC. Okay, I think this is an error with, I think I used up my uh, Google Collab. Yeah, there's something on that line. It just, because I'm using the free version, I think I have limited usage. By the way, you can use GPU, um, with this, you can you can use free GPU in Google Cloud. Just try again. If it didn't work, then we just skip this part. Yeah. Okay. It keeps spitting an error, but uh, you can run this. Uh, hopefully, the uh, the code works for you, and you will see that how you can train a neural network to uh, to uh, predict the handwritten digits. Okay, so that was the last example. Just before I go, I just want to show you a couple of uh, projects that I have done. We have a few One is um, for... Victor, excuse me. So we have a few questions yes. before you get, uh, before you move on. We have Haifa asking, okay. what's the best technique to improve sentiment analysis accuracy? Okay, again, this is a very general question. Sentiment analysis is, is, is a broad topic by itself, but usually people use recurrent neural networks in, in, uh, in most of the NLP, um, NLP projects. And uh, yeah, so, and, uh, so recurrent neural networks are, you know, they need a course by itself. So, but yeah. It just the short answer is that recurrent neural networks are usually used for any sentiment analysis and, and natural language processing techniques. Okay, and the second one, shouldn't we use data normalization with dealing with ANN? Yes, it's always a good practice to normalize your data in any machine learning um, uh, model if you want to use. 
it's always a good practice to normalize your data because it may or may not mess up your weights. Okay, but it's a good, good, good point. Any other question before I just have a um, last, uh, I just want to show you some of the, a couple of the projects that I have done. I would be happy if I take any other question. Otherwise, okay. Let's no, I think, move. I think there, there are only the last, uh, as of now. Yeah. There are only what? Only, only two. Only two questions actually. So we we are done with questions only now. Only two we'll, questions. We'll, yes. Yeah. We'll we'll wait for uh, the audience. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just a quick demo. Um, as I said, for the two of the projects that I've done, one is uh, uh, like uh, uh, continuing object object detection uh, using video streaming. So I just did this. Let me just show you. Okay. Yeah. So this, this uh, let me just show you the raw video first. This is a video from the days I was in the US. They're playing some with some friends volleyball. Okay. Okay, so that was the original video. And now uh, I used neural network to do object detection. So I load this video. Let me just run this. Okay. So you can see that uh, I load the video and uh, the algorithm detects detects the people. So you can see whenever there is, it finds that there is someone, it just puts this, uh, you know, rectangles around them. This is a technique which is uh, widely used in, uh, in uh, um, sometimes, I don't know, for some reason when I play it, I just have to force quit, but anyways. This is this technique is widely used in a lot of applications. For example, in uh, uh, anonymous uh, drivers uh, or, or vehicles, uh, they use this a lot, and they um, and uh, uh, they they use this a lot because they you know there are cameras around the around the vehicle, and each camera is uh, scanning the area surrounded by the vehicle, the, by the moving vehicle, and they, they need very accurate uh, algorithm to detect these objects so that they can send command. For example, if an object in front of uh, the vehicle, it sends a command to stop the vehicle, for instance, okay? So object detection is a very uh, wide, um, uh, it has a lot of uh, applications, and uh, you can see that with almost, Hundred lines of code, you can write. Uh, you can write, uh, you know, an object detection uh, algorithm, and uh, uh, a lot of these are are used with uh, uh, so-called OpenCV um, package. Open OpenCV stands for Open Computer Vision, which is a very popular package for computer vision uh, applications. And uh, the last one I wanted to show you is a very simple chat bot I made uh, and uh, that was a mini project. So I wanted to, again, demonstrate how easy it is to, to just uh, make a single chat, chat bot. And I, I just did this. Uh, so for, for, Ara for Arabic and English, of course you can do it for Arabic, but uh, it just, uh, because the package I used did not have some of the functionalities for the pure Arabic encoding. So I just decided to, to just do this, just make the Arabic 
English. So if I just tell them, uh, the bot answers, ahlan wa sahlan, for instance. Uh, and then, okay, the bot answers. Uh, and then, um, okay, I, I just ask, what can you do for me? Uh, and the bot says, I can do anything for you, okay? Uh, you say bye, Alamar. Again, uh, this is a very simple, and uh, there are, again, this chatbot itself has a, um, you know, a lot of different techniques and approaches can be done um, building this chatbot, but I uh, just wanted to show you that this is another, yet another uh, application of deep learning using some of these deep, deep learning models. So I'm loading, loading here uh, some uh, ready or, you know, previously made models and just, you know, use that to build my chatbot. Uh, with that, let's just see that if we have any question, I, I apologize, I think it took so long. What type of current and what and are there any new cool applications in Kuwait we should check out? Okay. One application that I am working on at the moment, uh, unfortunately, it's nighttime, but we, uh, I collaborated with some of my friends um, from college uh, that uh, they, uh, I mean, we, we came up with an algorithm. Again, it, it used object detection, but we integrated it with, uh, with a UV, uh, with, uh, with some other, uh, some other uh, features. For instance, uh, the, the, we set up the camera. So the camera, uh, I, I, I already installed it in, in my friend's shop. So the camera detects people and then uh, it calculates the distance between people. And so this can be used for, um, you know, post COVID social distancing uh, in reinforcement, let's say. So we are trying to program the, the device so that whenever uh, the distance between two people uh, is, the social distancing is violated, it, you know, it just sheds a red light, for instance. Of course, it can be used uh, for, and now we are working on like age detection so, so that we can install these cameras in the entrance of malls, for example, or showrooms for the uh, you know cars or banks so uh, this uh, so when you install those videos uh, we have we are trying to program and find the gender detection as well as age detection so that the bank owner or the manager of the bank or the uh, of the or the the owner of the shop or the owner of the mall they can have a very good analytics about who are visiting them uh, what is the uh, you know dominant age? What are the dominant uh, genders, and so on? So you can get a lot of so this this whole thing will be done automatically. Uh, but you know, again in Kuwait we have a lot of challenges. People uh, usually uh, do not pay for these things, uh, and uh, sometimes you get um, you get uh, frustrated of people not appreciating uh, these type of things, but uh, we are trying to. So with that, I conclude and thank you very much. And again, I apologize for that taking so long and maybe I bored you with a lot of math. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have one tiny request from uh, someone about your model that you just shared at the end, the chat box and video processing. Yeah. Are these available for the audience? Yeah. I can provide the video processing one, but the chat box, uh, because I will be working on it to improve it, uh, I can't um, provide the code at the moment. But the, the video one, I, I can, I can uh, definitely Thank do Thank you that. so I'd much. i be happy to uh, share it. So I, no problem, sure, sure. And my, my, my um, contact information is there if anyone needed help or, um, or had any comment or further discussion, I'll be happy to 
take that. Okay, so the floor is open to any questions. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, and we'll leave a few, couple of minutes before we end if nobody's to answer or sure. ask anything. Sure, sure, sure. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Dr. Haidar or Zainab, Dr. Zainab, thank you very much. I really enjoyed, uh, though I didn't uh, join since the beginning, but I just wanted to see, mashallah, the, uh, it is very, very deep uh, uh, information that you are providing. It's really uh, very nice. And Hasafa, uh, it's just, uh, it needs, it's a course by itself, by the way. It's condensed into, into two hours. Uh, definitely. So, so yeah, I think, uh, uh, Dr. <laughs> Zainab, if, we, if you can arrange the, the same, but with with the longer uh, uh, sessions as a real workshop, it would be very beneficial because I think we the, 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 um, I mean I'm, I enjoyed that and my my PhD is video recognition and image recognition using a neural network and uh, AI. So uh, you reminded me a lot of things now and I want also to thank you because I'm encouraging people in Kuwait to learn more about deep learning, machine learning, uh, uh, neural network. Uh, uh, object recognition, pattern recognition, and this is the future. So thank you so much again, and I hope that uh, uh, we see you again in uh, future workshops arranged by uh, Dr. Zainab and uh, JDG and others. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rami. Thank you so much. It's nice of you. Yeah, um, yeah. We are trying to push as well, but Eid Wahda Ma Tzafik. You know, <laughs> we need. Uh, we need more effort, we need uh, support, uh, but yeah, we're, we're, I'm trying as, as much as I can, but yeah. Um, I have um, also one you comment, so if, you allow, if you allow me, Dr. Haider. There are nowadays uh, packages, sure. uh, um, uh, commercial packages from, uh, for example, AWS, uh, SageMaker, there is uh, IBM uh, Watson, and there is SAP AI, uh, Microsoft Azure, and uh, 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 AI platform. I think also it's it's nice to touch base on those because they those are um, somehow been there in the government today. I mean, in some places and some workplaces, uh, if we can connect, because it it will shorten a lot of uh, time and effort to to um, to learn and uh, code. It's low code actually environment. What do you think of this approach? I mean. Uh, uh, for for people who uh, wants to have a quick learning. Uh, true, true. Um, I I agree. This is see the thing is if you want to catch up with everything, it's very difficult for one person because um, things are as you know things are moving really fast. Uh, Technology is improving. Technology is changing every single day. As I'm, as if you know, it's just nonstop. And uh, as you correctly mentioned, a lot of things are moving towards cloud, Microsoft Azure, uh, AWS, and now it requires a new technique on how to do all these things that I just um, demonstrated on the cloud. That's that's another challenge. Okay. Yeah. And, um, uh, but yeah, again, if we have, I, I, I was, I'm always dreaming of having an AI center and maybe, I don't know if you want to call it Kuwait International Center for AI. I'm dreaming for that, but I don't know where to, I don't, I mean, I, I don't have, I don't know people. So, but if no, we no, have I a center where, where yeah. we can. Mm -hmm. I think we can connect with uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Zainab uh, knows uh, Dr. Uh, Jasmine Mtawa. He has something Kuwait.ai. And we have a group of people who, in Kuwait mm -hmm. who are uh, working on AI. I think you know Jasim. But uh, we are a few, I mean, a small community in Kuwait of, uh, from AI. You know, I'm from the old school of AI where I do coding in C, C++ and uh, Prologue, which is now today you will never find anybody doing that. It's very ready-made packages uh, in a thousand of lines. Now it's the only yeah. package doing everything. So I, I think the, the, it is also a change. Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's very hard to find people from old school. It's all new people, new generation, and the new tools. So um, I don't know, um, maybe uh, Dr. Zainab can help us to, 
to form this community, AI community. There are different people doing that, but uh, everybody is, is his mm -hmm. own way. I mean, if we can do some sort of a group and uh, communicate with experts from old school to yeah, new that school. Would be, that would be perfect. That would be really nice. Idea. Yeah, I appreciate it. And one thing we've done with the GDD, uh, GDG uh, Kuwait network, uh, especially on Slack, is to build those communities within the channels that we have. And um, um, we've identified lots of different experts in different areas. Some have already been recruited as organizers with us. Um, and, and we are looking to build um, um, uh, like you said, uh, a place where we can go ask questions and have the experts answer them and support us in that and know what types of projects are happening. Um, AI and machine learning are very um, uh, easy to reach now and easy to implement. So I'll give you an example of what I just did in a research project. So uh, I had interviews that I needed to transcribe and transcription services, if anybody's done that before, means taking the audio and typing everything that's been said um, into text um, and usually you hire a third party and pay them per minute to transcribe uh, your audio and uh, so I did this quick experiment and used the cloud uh, speech AI on cloud on Google Cloud and transcribed them with um, very good accuracy given that it was a Kuwaiti dialect um, I think it offers us solutions to things we are um, used to doing differently. And so uh, there is a potential and we want people to understand a lot more of them. The resources we get through um, Quick Labs are, uh, include uh, machine learning things, not particularly neural networks and stuff, but chatbots is one of them. And we've run a chatbot session before and we might or we should run it again, I think. Um, yes. But, uh, let's, let's touch base later and, and build that community and find more people willing to explore and share their knowledge. Excellent. Thank you very much again. And hopefully to catch up uh, very soon in a different session. Sure, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for you attending. Have any other question? comment okay so i think we're good to go uh, thank you doctor for your time and for the uh, overview and everything that you mentioned i think your example is really really interesting and and um the takeaway is very beneficial and we appreciate your time with us thank today so and let's talk about doing a more like spread out type example in the future something that we can build up um um, and if anybody's listening and cares to uh, suggest, please let us know. Uh, and uh, thanks a lot. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Have a good night. You Thank too, Victoria.